how to approach the management of a child with meningitis. And this is something that we see in all facilities around the country. Thank you so much um, for joining and tuning in um, to listen to what um, our, our experts have to say on this. Um, my name is Dr. Nansen Gumba, um, representing from Kenyatta National Hospital. Um, a few things to note even before we begin our session. Um, for CPD points, um, this is a CPD accredited webinar and everyone who attends this webinar is entitled to CPD. Um, please check your emails or your portal for your CPD points. In case you have any challenges, kindly email us at knhcpd at gmail.com or at cpdpharmacy at gmail.com and we'll be able to assist in that area. Um, to tomorrow, today evening, we'll also be having another webinar um, from 7 to 8.30. We'll be talking about laparoscopic ectopic pregnancies. And if you're interested to hear about that, um, kindly um, using the same link, join, and you'll be able to um, participate in that webinar. Tomorrow, we'll also be having a webinar at the same time and one in the evening where we'll be celebrating the World Psoriasis Day. Um, and we'll be learning more about um, psoriasis and dermatological conditions. So um, feel free to also tune in and um, join the webinar and we'll be able to learn more about um, dermatological conditions. Right now we have um, pediatricians with us and they'll be taking us through how to approach managing a child with meningitis. Today's presenter will be Dr. Lucia Amolo. She'll introduce herself and begin the, the presentation. Karibu, Dr. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. My name is Dr. Lucia Amolo. I'm a pediatrician working at the Kenyatta National Hospital. And with me is Dr. Douglas Makewa and Bill Kigathi as my panelists. Today, we'll be discussing approach to the management of a child with meningitis. So I'm presenting FM. She's a one year, four month old female girl who was admitted on 12th of September, 2020 with a weight of 7.9 kgs. So FM's first clinical visit was in Mwala Hospital. She was seen in late August where she presented with a four day history of diarrhea and vomiting. The diarrhea was um, non-bloody mucoid and uh, reported several episodes in a day, about five to six in a day with on and off vomiting. The parents also reported that she was lethargic. She was treated with ORS, zinc, and antibiotics as an outpatient. The child did not improve. The GE results, but the parents report that she remained lethargic. The parents also reported that she became increasingly drowsy. They went back to the same facility that is Mwala Hospital, and she was referred to Machakos Level 5 Hospital. This happened in a span of four days. So at Machakos Level 5 Hospital, the child was immediately admitted, was noted by the clinicians to be having conversions. They were generalized to neclonic seizures, lasting between five and 30 minutes. Um, there were multiple in a day, about five to 10 actually in a day, and recurrent. The patient remained drowsy post ictally. The con convulsions were associated with fever. There was a history of night sweats and weight loss for about one month. Of note was that the father had been diagnosed with pulmonary TB based on sputum that was positive and had been commenced on anti-TBs in February 2020 and had completed the treatment in July 2020 about a month before the child presented with their birth. So at Machakos Level 5 Hospital, unfortunately from their referral note, not much was reported on the clinical findings. However, they noted that the child had a bulging anterior fontanelle, a stiff neck and a VPU was at P. The child was diagnosed with TB meningitis. Again, um, they didn't uh, mention whether they did any confirmatory tests, but based on the father having TB, pulmonary TB, the child diagnosed with this, was initiated on anti-TBs. So initially was given the intensive 
face drugs. Those are two tabs of the fixed dose combination, RHZ, and two tabs of ethambutol together with peridoxine and prednisolone. The child was also initiated on ceftriaxone. One week later, the clinicians noted that there was elevation in liver transaminases, actually more than 10 times normal. The ALT was 488, while the AST was 3,573, and the gamma GT was 110. The clinicians uh, therefore immediately stopped the anti-TBs, diagnosed the child with acute liver failure, secondary to anti-TBs, and referred the child to Kenyatta National Hospital. So within two weeks from onset of the first symptoms, the child presented in KNH. At KNH, we noted that there was a two-week history of convulsions. As I mentioned, they were generalized tonic-clonic, lasting between five and uh, 30 minutes, with eye rolling, frothing around the mouth. There was associated hotness of body, which had been going on for one month, reduced level of consciousness for two weeks, and weight loss for a month. Prior to the loss of consciousness, the parents reported that the child had been extremely irritable with on and off vomiting. They also reported that her limbs had become stiff and she had lost the ability to walk for two weeks. The referral, as I mentioned, was also due to the deranged liver enzyme. So past medical history, all the prior admissions were related to the above condition commencing one month prior to presenting in KNH. There were no known food or drug allergies and there was no history of transfusion. So the birth history, the child was born on the way to hospital. Obviously, it was an SVD delivery at eight months. The birth weight was 2.4 kgs, so the child was a low birth weight, cried after birth, so we assumed the APGA score was good. Mother reported that, and that the antenatal history was non-remarkable. Her ANC profile was good, and she also reported that she had a normal pregnancy without any illnesses or complications. For the immunization history, the mother did not have the vaccine card, but she reported having received all KP vaccines on time. Neurodevelopmental milestones, uh, previously normal before onset of symptoms, they all regressed since the symptoms began. We asked about gross motor, the child had been walking, fine motor had been scribbling, language, the child was able to say some words like baba, mama, bye bye. Cognitive was able to follow simple instructions and social, well, social played appropriately for age. So for the nutritional history, the mother reported that the child had been a good feeder until one month prior to, uh, to the onset of the illness when the appetite started reducing. Unfortunately, the mother didn't have the growth card, which is something that we'd have liked to see so that we can see if the weight had been tracking well. The weight at admission was 7.9 kilos, which is quite low for a one year, four month old. We'd expect the weight to be around 15 kgs. And as I had mentioned, had been a low birth weight at 2.4 kilos. Family social history, this was an only child. They lived in a one roomed house with the mother and grandmother in Mwala. The father visited them often, but he didn't stay with them. Uh, they stayed about two times per week. And as I mentioned, the father had recently been diagnosed with TB and completed anti-TBs in July 2020. None of the other family members were tested and the child had not been put on isoniazid prophylaxis. So the clinical findings, on general examination and presentation in KNH, it was a sick looking child, was quite febrile. There was no pallor, no jaundice, no edema. There was no lymphadenopathy and no finger clubbing. Uh, the uh, mid upper arm circumference was 13 centimeters, which put the child at risk. The temperature was 39.2, so it was febrile. Respiratory rate was at 54, a bit high. Heart rate was at 132, it was saturating at 96% on oxygen via prongs, one liter per minute. So moving on specifically to the neuro neurological examination, we noted that the child was in decerebrate posturing. The head circumference was 52 centimeters. Um, I've just plotted it on a chart for you. So we can see that the head circumference was higher than what is expected. Had sutural diastasis, had a bulging anterior fontanelle, and there were no syndromic features. So again, on the neurological examination, we looked at the cranial nerves. Usually for children, you have to kind of modify the way you examine your cranial nerves because you wouldn't expect a one year, four month old to be very cooperative. So olfactory usually tests um, smell. We, we were unable to test it because of the level of consciousness. 
optic, um, that vision, we noted that the pupils were four millimeters bilaterally equal, but there was a sluggish reaction to light. So we were testing the direct and consensual reflex. There was no anisocoria or unequal pupils. We were unable to test the visual field, field red de degeneration or visual acuity, which is something important to test when you're testing the optic nerve. For the oculomotor, trochlear, and abusant nerve, which we know innervate the extraocular muscles, we were unable again to test them due to the reduced level of consciousness. However, we noted that the eyes had, were adapted with a downward gaze or sunset gaze. The trigeminal, which is cranial nerve five, was noted to move. Um, the child was noted to move the jaw occasionally. We know that uh, trigeminal nerves innervate the, nerve, the muscles of mastication. And also the child was irritable when the face touched. So we assumed that the sensation was good. For the facial nerve, we noted that there was symmetry bilaterally when the child was crying during the sternal rub. The vestibular cochlear nerve, we could not test it. The glossopharyngeal and vagus nerve, we tested by doing the gag reflex and it was present. Spinal accessory nerve was not tested due to the level of consciousness. And the hypoglossal nerve, uh, there was no tongue deviation when the child was crying. So for the motor exam, there were no fasciculations, which would point towards a motor neuron lesion. The child was irritable and crying during examination, so it was a bit difficult to test if there was any muscular tenderness. However, we noted that there was power grid two on all muscle groups. That means that movement is possible only if gravity is eliminated. There was hypertonia on all the muscle groups, that is grade four. And we also noted ankle clonus and spasticity of the limbs. Other neurological examination, there was hyperreflexia of all the deep tendon reflexes. That's the biceps, triceps, brachioridialis, knee jack, and Achilles. The Babinski sign was present. That's uh, the plan, the, the toes usually fan upwards when you rub the, the, the bottom of the feet, foot with a sharp object. Coordination and gait could not be tested because the child was non-ambulatory. And sensation, again, was not tested due to the child's age. So the investigations that we did initially, um, we did a CRP, which was high at 11.5, and the CRP went up serially uh, to 45. HB, we noted that there was a microcytic hypochromic anemia, which pointed to iron deficiency. There was also a re reactive thrombocytosis with the platelets being elevated. WBC initially was not markedly elevated, but during the course of the stay, we noted that the WBC rose. There was also a slight neutrophilia in the course of the stay and a slight lymphocytosis. Again, we should note that this child had already been initiated on antibiotics when they were in Machakos level five for about 10 days. So LST, LT, as I mentioned, pre-admission from Machakos, they noted that the transaminases were markedly elevated. We did a serial monitoring of the transaminases, and actually when they fell to less than 1.5 of expected, we reinitiated the anti-TBs. Um, the rest of the liver markers were essentially normal. We noted that there was a slight hyponatremia at presentation. The potassium, urea, and creatinine were okay. We also noted that there was a marked hypocalcemia, which we corrected actively with 10% calcium gluconate and then supplemental calcium because of the active convulsions that the child had. The LP was deferred initially because of concerns of raised intracranial pressure until the CT scan was done. Eventually, um, the CT scan was done and the neurosurgeons had to come in. They did a ventricular tap and we were able to um, uh, take that CSF for analysis. We noted that the protein was markedly elevated at 1,438, and the glucose was low at 1.1. The Indian ink gram stain uh, did not yield anything, and there was no growth obtained on culture. The blood culture um, grew micrococcus, which we thought was a skin contaminant. The coagulation screen was normal. PBF, we noted a microcytic hypochromic picture with mild leukocytosis, and uh, platelets were elevated. HIV test was done, which was negative, and BS for malaria was negative. This is the cities of the head that we did for the child. What stands out uh, is that there is marked uh, dilatation of the ventricles, actually all the, ventri all the ventricles, the lateral, the third, and the fourth ventricles. 
um, we also note that there's sulcal effacement. We can't really see the sulci and gyri pattern of this child, which points toward a uh, marked hydrocephalus that is compressing on the brain parenchyma. This is the chest X-ray that we did of the child. Unfortunately, it's not a very good X-ray because you're unable to see the vertebral columns. However, there were some patchy oxities on the right perihyla area. So we made a diagnosis of meningitis, secondary to tuberculosis high on the list because of the father being treated for TB. And we also considered other bacterial pathogens, especially because the CSF protein was quite high and the glucose was low, although we did not yield anything. Again, as I mentioned, the child had been on ceftriaxone. We also made a diagnosis of post-meningitic sequelae, that is convulsive disorder and hydrocephalus. Also, we made a diagnosis of acute liver failure secondary to anti-TBs. So management. In casualty, um, we know that for a, a child who comes in convulsing, we usually use our ABCDE approach. So the airway and breathing, the child, the airway was patent, the child was breathing spontaneously, but was in distress. So we, we started the child on O2 via prongs, one liter per minute. Circulation, there was good perfusion. The cap refill was instantaneous. The peripheries were warm, had a tachycardia of 163. So we fixed an IV cannula. At this point, we did an RBS, which came out as 7.4. We know that hypoglycemia can be a cause of convulsions in children. At this point, we also drew the bloods for the septic screen, electrolytes, LFTs, and the kidney function tests, which I've told you. For disability and exposure, we noted that the AVPU was at P, the child was febrile, and we gave adult suppository, then we transferred the child to the ward. So in the ward, uh, for the antibiotic and antiviral treatment, since the child had been on ceftriaxone in the previous facility for about 10 days, we opted to give uh, meropenem at 40 milligrams per kg per dose, also because we noted that the CRP had been going up. We also gave amikacin and acyclovir for antiviral cover. The anti-TBs, as I mentioned, had been halted in the previous facility due to elevated transaminases. We eventually restarted them in the ward once the transaminases were 1.5 times above normal and the child tolerated them well. So we started on the RHZ, two tabs, and ethambutol. We also added peridoxine because of the peripheral neuropathy and prednisolone, which we add for children with TB meningitis. For the convulsions, uh, the child convulsed on admission, so was loaded with phenytoin at 15 milligrams per kg. Then we commenced on a maintenance dose of five milligrams per kg per day. The convulsions, however, persisted while in the ward. Again, we loaded with phenobab at 15 milligrams per kg per day, then a maintenance of five milligrams per kg per day. Unfortunately, the referral note did not tell us any anticonvulsants that they had given when the child was charcoal. Also, we, uh, because the child had marked hypocalcemia of 1.58, we gave IV calcium glucose, gluconate 10%, and then we gave calcium supplementation, that is Z-cal. So other management, the neurosurgical team was called in view of the hydrocephalus, and a VP shunt was inserted to relieve the CSF pressures, was reviewed by the nutritionist because of the weight of 7.9 kgs, the, NG tube, uh, the child was started on treatment for malnutrition with F75, then F100, which the child tolerated well. We also added multivitamins and we planned for ion supplementation on completing the antibiotics because of the microcytic hypochromic picture. The child was also under follow-up by the occupational therapist team because of the marked spasticity of the limb. The patient did well, completed 14 days of antibiotic cover was discharged after three weeks on uh, RH um, for 10 months after completing the intensive phase. The AEDs were also discharged on AEDs, that's phenobarbiton and phenytoin. By the time the, the child was being discharged, the convulsions had ceased, at least the clinical convulsions had ceased, and was for continued follow-up by the OT at Mwala. Then the child was to come in for a neurological review as an outpatient in Kenyatta National Hospital. So moving on to the discussion, we'll discuss meningitis. So meningitis is a severe life-threatening infection of the central nervous system that usually requires immediate uh, medical attention. Even with appropriate treatment, morbidity and mortality can remain high. So it's 
very important for us as clinicians to able to, to be able to pick up the signs of meningitis very quickly. So meningitis is basically inflammation of the brain meninges. If you look at the diagram on the right, I've tried to illustrate to you the layers of um, from all the way from the scalp to the brain parenchyma. So the scalp usually has five layers. We have the skin, connective tissue, the aponeurotica, gallia, the loose areola tissue, and the pericranium. So once we move from the skull, that's the periosteum, we have the meninges. So we have the dura. The dura has two layers. Um, that's the periosteal layer and the meningeal layer. Then from the dura, we move, move on and we have the arachnoid. And below the arachnoid, we have the pia. The pia usually follows the sulci and gyral pattern of the brain. So CSF usually flows between the arachnoid and the pia matter. So meningitis would be inflammation of the meninges of the brain. And cephalitis would be inflammation of the brain parenchyma. That is the cerebral cortex. Now, the nervous system can be infected by a variety of pathogens. They can be bacterial, they can be viral, they can be fungal, or they can be parasitic. So before we move on to talking more about meningitis, it's good to understand what the blood-brain barrier, which is the protective uh, mechanism of the brain. So capillary wall and the filial cells in the body are usually separated from each other by fenestrations, which allow relatively free passage of fluids and solids. However, in the brain, the capillary wall and the filial cells are usually linked by tight junctions, as you can see in the diagram, which usually um, prevents uh, free flow of material. And most substances, except oxygen, carbon dioxide, and glucose, have to pass uh, in between these tight junctions via active transport. And these endothe endothelial cells and tight junct junctions are what usually form the blood-brain brain barrier. So usually um, infections, brain tumors, and trauma can cause disruption of the blood-brain barrier. And that is how we end up having end up having infection going into the brain. So this is just a diagram to explain uh, what, uh, what I'm saying. Of note is once an infection penetrates the brain, it's able to flow freely between the brain parenchyma and the CSF. So meningitis can be caused, as I've said, by a variety of pathogens. For the bacterial pathog pathogens, usually you can end up with meningitis. You can end up with a brain abscess or an epidural abscess. So bacterial pathogen, pathogens usually gain access either directly from trauma or spread from other systems. That is usually following an infection, you have inflammation, you have breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, and the infection gains entry into the brain. Usually for bacterial meningitis, the onset of symptoms is very acute and very rapid. So the diagram you can see down there shows us the common pathogens that cause meningitis based on the age. We can see in the younger age group, it's mainly E. coli, group B streptococci, and mysteri mysteria monocytogens that cause meningitis. These are usually acquired um, usually during delivery as the, the fetus passes through the vaginal tract or if the mother had some form of infection. As the child gets older from around three months to seven years, the pathogens change. Now we have H influenza coming in, Neisseria meningitis, and Streptococcus pneumonia as the main bacterial pathogens causing pneumonia. Sorry, causing meningitis. Now, um, meningococcal, I'll speak a little bit about menig meningococcal disease. So meningococcal disease is caused by Neisseria meningitis. It's transmitted primarily through respiratory dog. Uh, droplets. The highest burden of disease is usually in young infants and toddlers. And we have 13 groups of meningococci that is, have been identified. Five of them are responsible for nearly all the invasive infections. That is uh, group A, B, C, W, and Y. On the diagram on the right, you can see that uh, Northern Kenya falls in the African meningitic belt, which usually runs all the way from Senegal to Ethiopia. During um, dry, the dry windy season around November to July is when uh, we have more cases of meningitis occurring in this meningitic belt. Actually, um, because of the seasonal meningitis that happens in this belt, the government came up uh, with uh, the vaccine, giving the meningococcal A vaccine in the northern Kenya to try and fight meningitis occurring in this belt.
So for meningococcal meningitis, it's the most common clinical presentation of meningococcal disease. Uh, so commonly children will present with meningitis or septicemia. Sometimes they can present with a pneumonic picture, septic arthritis, pericarditis, epiglottitis, or supraglottitis. And these presentations are more often associated with the rest, less prevalent meningococcal groups. The most characteristic features of meningococcal disease is that it has a rapid progression of illness, which can lead to death within 24 hours of the first symptom. In young children and adults, some of the clinical features may be particularly associated with meningococcal disease, including limb, joint, muscle pain, uh, cold hands and feet, um, that, um, that is signs of shock, and pale and mottled skin. Now, the characteristic non-blanching rash that we all know of meningococcal called meningitis is usually a late sign. So as clinicians, we should not wait to diagnose meningococcal meningitis based on this non-blanching rash that you can see in the diagram above. You should have a high index of, of suspicion from the clinical features that the child presents with. Again, I'll mention on TB meningitis, the pediatric population is at risk, especially the immunocompromised and those of us who live in endemic areas like Kenya. Typically, tuberculous meningitis will present with a history of headache, lethargy, and meningeal signs, which usually appear over a course of several weeks. If untreated, the child can have coma, hydrocephalus, and death. Our patient had coma and had hydrocephalus. Tuberculous involvement of the epidural space and vertebral bones, called POTS disease, can also occur. The meningeal involvement usually results from a reactivation of previous TB infection, and signs of pulmonary TB actually are often not present at the time of presentation, like was the case for our child. CSF would usually show an elevated WBC and lymphocyte predominance with elevated protein and low glucose, low glucose like was the case for us. It's important to note that the mycobacterium tuberculosis organism may not be cultured from the CSF. So viral pathogens can also cause meningitis. So viral meningitis tends to be less fulminant than bacterial meningitis, and usually recovery occurs spontaneously within one to two weeks. In contrast, we can have viral encephalitis, which we say is inf infection of the brain parenchyma. It's quite severe. Often when you have very viral encephalitis, you'll have a meningoencephalitis, meaning the meninges and the brain parenchyma. There are many organisms that can cause viral meningitis, including the enteroviruses such as Kuxaki, mumps, HIV, happy simplex, CMV, varicella, and measles are other viruses that can cause meningitis. So measles is occasionally associated with a delayed, slowly progressive fatal encephalitis, which we call subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. However, the incidence is low due to the successful implementation of the measles vaccine. Happy zoster, which can also cause a meningoencephalitis, usually is associated with a painful rash uh, conforming to the nerve root distribution. We know that we live in a place where there's a lot of HIV, so HIV increases susceptibility to other pathogens, as well as causing aseptic men meningitis. For viral meningitis, we often cannot identify the cause. So viral meningitis often causes aseptic meningitis. So aseptic meningitis usually occurs when you have clinical, clinical signs and symptoms of meningitis, but you can't really get anything from the laboratory testing. And it has many infectious and non-infectious causes. I've mentioned some of them like MTV, MTB, mycoplasma pneumonia, the viral pathogens. It also has non-infectious causes such as autoimmune diseases like SLE, isoniazid, and IV immunoglobulins can all cause aseptic meningitis. So parasitic and fungal infections can also cause meningitis. Parasitic infections can involve the nervous system, including cysticercosis, toxoplasmosis, Malaria, uh, you know, Kenya, we live in a malaria endemic region, African sleeping sickness, amoebiasis. We've been hearing of many cases in the US of um, the brain eating amoeba, it's a nigleria foliary, which is causing uh, meningoencephalitis. We also have rickettsial illnesses, hydatid cyst, and schistosomiasis. Fungal infections of the CNS are un uncommon in their immunocompetence competent host, but we know HIV can occur in children, so they can also be predisposed to fungal infections. 
So the main signs and symptoms of meningitis would have signs of meningeal irritation, which would be headache, neck stiffness, photophobia, which is sensitivity to light, and phonophobia, which is sensitivity to noise. Presentation, it's very important to note this, that in the young and immunocompromised, presentation may vary. So a neonate with meningitis may just have poor feeding, irritability, lethargy, apnea, shock, pallor, hypothermia, a bulging anterior fontanelle. For infants and children, they may have opisthotonus posturing, headache, coma, anorexia. So basically, um, the symptoms can really vary in the pediatric po population. However, for bacterial meningitis, the onset is usually acute, but for fungal causes, it tends to be more gradual. So um, just a mention of upper motor neuron lesion versus lower motor neuron lesion in meningitis. So upper motor neuron lesions, usually are lesions that project from the brain cortex via, via, so an upper motor neuron usually projects from the brain cortex via the corticospinal tract to the lower motor neuron. So an upper motor neuron lesion still starts from the brain parenchyma. It travels through both the corticospinal and cortical uh, bulb tract through the internal capsule, through the, the midbrain, the pons and medulla, and enters the spinal cord. Once in a, the spinal cord, it now forms a synapse with the lower motor neuron, and the lower motor neuron in turn projects from the anterior horn cell of the spinal cord to the peripheral muscle. So commonly in meningitis, we have compression of the corticospinal and the corticobulbar tract at the level of the internal capsule, and usually this occurs commonly when you have hydrocephalus or uh, anything that causes a raised intracranial pressure. So the hydrocephalus would, would usually cause compression at the internal capsule. So the corticospinal tract is compressed and we end up having an upper motor neuron lesion, which was the case in our patient. So in order to differentiate between an upper motor neuron lesion and a lower motor neuron lesion, you usually look number one for weakness. Both of them will have weakness atrophy, usually lower motor neuron lesions have marked atrophy. Upper motor neuron lesions don't have too much atrophy. However, if you have disuse atrophy where you don't use the limb for a long time, then you start having a bit of the disuse atrophy in an upper motor neuron lesion. Fasciculations would not be present in upper motor neuron lesions. The tone and the reflex are usually markedly increased in upper motor neuron lesions. So that again, this tells you that um, your clinical examination will help you point towards where the lesion is in your patient. So in the case of our patient, we had an upper motor neuron lesion due to compression of the corticospinal tract and the corticobulbar tract by the hydrocephalus. So moving on to just discuss a little bit about hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is caused by excess CSF in the intracranial cavity. And this condition usually can result from either excess CSF production, obstruction of flow at any point in the ventricles or the subarachnoid space, or decrease in reabsorption via the arachnoid granulations. So in meningitis, two and three are the most common etiologies. Obstruction can occur as a result of the debris and adhesions that occur from the inflammatory process and from the infection. So decreased CSF reabsorption can cause hydrocephalus when the arachnoid granulations are damaged or clogged up. So we end up getting either communicating or non-communicating hydrocephalus, depending on where the obstruction is. Now, usually in infants, when the cranial switches have not yet fused, the skull tends to expand to reduce the elevated intracranial pressure. And so we end up having an increase in the size of the head circumference. So it's important for us as clinicians to know what the normal head circumference would be for a child. So for a neonate, it would be around 35 to 37 centimeters. In the first three months, it increases by two centimeters per month. In the next, from three to six months, it increases by one centimeter per month. And from six months to one year, it increases by 0 0.5 centimeters per month. So we should always have this at the back of our mind and we should chart it on the child's health booklet, especially if you're suspicious of something. A bulging anterior fontanelle is also a very important sign of elevated uh, pressure in infants. So we need to know as clinicians when we'd expect the anterior fontanelle to close. So for meningitis, the eye is something very important to look at. We, when we have raised intracranial pressure, we may have an equal pupils or an isochoria. We may have abnormal fundoscopy. On the diagram on the top right, 
um, the first uh, picture you can see a normal patient. You can see the optic disc margin very clearly. You can also see the optic cup margin very clearly. In the other diagram, the patient has meningitis and you see that everything is quite obscured. So if you're able to do, uh, take an ophthalmoscope, examine your eye and see if you have any signs of raised intracranial pressure. Now the sixth cranial nerve or the abducens nerve usually has a very long cause and is susceptible to stretching. So in mild or slow developing cases of hydrocephalus, a sixth nerve palsy may be seen, which, is caused by which causes incomplete or slow abduction of the eye in the horizontal direction. When hydrocephalus is more severe, you tend to see inward devi deviation of one or both eyes, at, which may be present at rest. So hydrocephalus can also cause dilatation of the suprapineal recess of the third ventricle. So there's a diagram on the right below, which is just trying to simplify what I am saying. So if you have dilatation of the suprapineal recess of the third ventricle, it pushes on a section of the brain, midbrain called the tectum. When it pushes on a section of the midbrain called the tectum, this section is usually assist in outward gaze for, for pediatric, for, for all of us. So when you compress on it, it can cause mis, mid function of this section. And therefore the child is unable to gaze upwards, what we call perinode syndrome. And this is how, this is how hydrocephalus usually brings the sunset appearance in children because the eye, you see that the eyes will be deviated inwards because of the sixth nerve palsy and downwards because of the perinode syndrome. So moving on to diagnosis of uh, meningitis, it's very important to do a random blood sugar. This is a bedside test. Hypoglycemia can cause convulsions. You need to do your septic screen. So you do your TBC, your CRP, you do your procalcitonin if you're able to do it. CSF analysis is important. There are very many things that we can um, use to, uh, just by looking at the CSF and doing certain tests, it can help us point towards the diagnosis. So you need to look at the appearance of the CSF. If you're able to do the opening pressures, you do your protein, which you say may be high, your glucose, your microscopic culture and sensitivity, biochemistry, your Krag, your gram stain, your biofire, which is a DNA PCR test to try and um, culture common causes of meningitis, and gene expert. Although we say sometimes you may not be able to use the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Electrolytes, again, are very important. Hypocalcemia can cause convulsions. Hypomagnesemia and hyponatremia can also cause convulsions. Our patient had hyponatremia and hypocalcemia. Imaging, again, would be guided uh, by how your patient presents. CT scan is, especially if there are signs of raised intracranial pressure, should be done urgently before you do your lumbar puncture. Other tests will be guided by the clinical picture. For example, if you're unable to do a gene expert, then you can just do a quick man too to see if there are any signs of uh, TB. So the diagram on the right, I'm just trying to demonstrate to remind us all on the landmarks for doing your lumbar puncture. So you should note that the bottom portion of the spinal cord or what we call the conus medullaris usually ends at about L2 or L3 level of the vertebral bone. And the nerve roots continue downwards into the lumbar system, forming what we call the coda equina. So to avoid hitting the spinal cord, the spinal needle usually is inserted into the subarachnoid space between L4 and L5. And the thing principle is to feel the posterior iliac crest, which would serve as your landmark. And right about there would be the L4, L5 space. If you go too high, you can cause damage to the spinal cord. So traumatic tap, I think many of us, many of us have uh, experienced this, where you do your lumbar puncture and the sample comes out as bloody. Normally, red blood cells are not present in CSF. Red blood cells in CSF can indicate a subarachnoid hemorrhage. They can indicate hemorrhagic herpes, encephalitis, or simply a traumatic tap, which usually happens when you hit the blood vessels as you do your lumbar puncture. So the traumatic tap can be distinguished from pathological subarachnoid blood, number one, by the number of red blood cells. So the number of red blood cells would usually decrease from the first to the last tubes of CSF collected in a traumatic tap. 
when we're doing our lumbar puncture, we are always encouraged to put the CSF in at least three bottles. So if you line these bottles, if it's a traumatic tap, you'll see that the CSF goes lightening. Um, if CSF is centrifuged immediately, yellowish or xanthochromic appearance will be present in subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is due to old blood, but it will be normal appearance in a traumatic tap. So this is how um, we distinguish to whether the blood in CSF is pathological or it's due to a traumatic tap. So if you're unable to get um, a good CSF sample and you have a traumatic tap, you should know that it can confuse the analysis of CSF WBCs because WBCs are introduced as well as the RBCs. So as a general guideline, in a traumatic tap, one white blood cell is introduced into the CSF for every 700 red blood cells. So the person at the lab can actually do a correction for the traumatic tap so that you can get an accurate picture. Large amounts of hemorrhage in CSF from any cause can also sometimes result in reduced CSF glucose or an elevated protein. So a traumatic tap we need to be careful as clinicians to interpret it well so that we get a good indication of what the patient has. So just a little bit about CSF analysis. In bacterial meningitis, the WBCs would be markedly elevated and there'll be poly polymorphonuclear cells that uh, typically, typically the granulocytes. If you have a TB meningitis and a viral meningitis, then you'd also have an elevated WBC, but it won't be markedly elevated and predominantly lymphocytes, as would be other viral meningitis. For the protein in bacterial meningitis, the protein is, count is usually extremely high. In our patient, it was extremely high, and that's why we opted to treat for bacterial meningitis aside from the TB meningitis. The protein would still be high in other causes of meningitis, but not as high is, as in the bacterial cause. For the glucose, it would be low in most cases. So how do you treat convulsions? This I took from the basic pediatric protocol. It's a simplified way of just telling you how you're supposed to treat um, con a convulsing patient, but ensure you do your ABC, the airway, the breathing, the circulation. You must start this patient on oxygen because convulsions are a hypoxic uh, event and they can cause further damage to the brain. You must check for hypoglycemia in the immediate cause. You, uh, in, the, in the immediate period, you can give your diazepam. You can load with diazepam or lorazepam or midazolam, whichever you have uh, available. You load it only two times. If you've loaded twice and the convulsions are still persisting, then our pediatric protocol tells us that we give phenobab, although we can also give phenytoin. So you can look at your basic pediatric protocol just to give you an overview on how you manage a convulsing patient who comes in status epilepticus. So there are many other drugs that are available locally for managing of status epilepticus. We have phenytoin, we have levetiracetam, which is Keppra, and we have sodium valproate, which is epilim. All of these can actually be loaded in the patient. So check your local protocol for the latest update in managing convulsing patients. Mm -hmm. So the choice of antibiotics, again, this is guided by local epidemiology, the common pathogens that you'll expect based on the age, the patient's clinical profile, and the laboratory supportive results. Drug resistance, of course, is of concern in the treatment of various organisms. So in our setting, we commonly use cephalosporins, cephalosporins ceftriaxone, cefotaxim are usually our drugs of choice. And uh, ideally, we should treat for at least 10 to 14 days. But as I said, the clinical picture of the patient will guide you. There are many other antibiotics that you can use based on how the patient is doing. So just to touch a little bit on treatment of TB meningitis. So for TB meningitis, including uh, TB bone and TB of the joints, usually we have to treat for um, one year. So you do two months of the RHZE and 10 months of the continuation phase. If you suspect drug-resistant TB, then you need to consult a specialist. So I'll just mention a little bit about anti-TB-induced hepatitis because our patient uh, presented with this. So elevated liver enzymes may occur in the first week of treatment. Asymptomatic mild elevation of serum liver en enzymes, really less than five times the normal value, is actually not an indication to stop TB treatment, and this is from our national TB guidelines. All children with GI symptoms, including hepatitis, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, should have their liver functions assessed. 
If you have elevated liver enzymes less than five times normal without symptoms, continue with your TB treatment, but closely monitor the liver function and consider senior review. If you have elevated liver enzymes of less than five percent, uh, less than five times normal with symptoms, you need to stop your, all your anti-TBs and refer for further management. If the liver enzymes are elevated more than five times normal, as was the case with our patient, you stop your anti-TBs and refer the patient for further management. Addition to that, you need to screen for other causes of hepatitis, and you should not reintroduce these drugs until liver functions have normalized. It's always good to involve an expert. For us, we worked together with the infectious disease team. And when our transaminases were 1.5, we, we, we successfully reintroduced the anti-TBs. So prevention is key for meningitis. Vaccination remains key in prevention of meningitis. We need to edu educate parents on importance of vaccination at all points of contact from the time of conception. And this is key in fighting meningitis. There are several vaccines available against meningococcal disease. We have meningococcal, meningococcal A conjugate vaccine, which was used uh, in the Northern Kenya during the meningitic outbreaks. We have uh, meningococcal C conjugate vaccine, and uh, we have also the tetravalent ACYW conjugate vaccine and the meningococcal polysaccharide vaccine, which offers a shorter protective time. Now, unfortunately, we have not yet incorporated the meningococcal vaccine in our CAPI schedule. So this is something that we are hoping to do uh, as time goes by. We have successfully implement, implemented the pneumococcal and the Haemophilus influenza B conjugate vaccine. And we know uh, pneumococcal and H influenza are common causes of meningitis in the pediatric uh, patients. So just a quick mention on isoniazid preventive therapy. Every child under the age of five exposed to a person with bacteriologically confirmed TB should be screened for active disease. Isoniazid preventive therapy should be given to all children under five who are exposed to a case of infectious TB irrespective of the HIV status. So we failed our patient in this. All HIV infected children above one year should be on the isoniazid preventive therapy and HIV infected children under one year who have been exposed to a case of infectious TB should also be on the preventative therapy. These were my references. Thank you. This is our patient. We'll take questions now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Molo. Um, that was an excellent presentation on approach to management of a child with meningitis. Um, so we will get into the question and answer session right now. Um, please, if you have any questions, you can type them out in the question and answer chat box. And our panelists for today, uh, who are Dr. Lucia Amolo, our presenter, Dr. Douglas Makewa, a pediatric neurologist at Kenyatta National Hospital, and Dr. Bill Kigathi, who's a pediatrician at Kenyatta National Hospital, will take the questions. Um, so I'll start with the first question, and I think it's already been answered, but I um, you can still um, answer it. So one of the participants asks, uh, what would be the main causes? Maybe what do you see as one of the main causes of meningitis in, in your practice? Any of the panelists can take the question. I hope I can be heard with her here. <clears throat> the main cause of meningitis in children um, is still a, a, acute bacterial meningitis. The problem is usually the diagnosis to establish, to confirm the diagnosis of acute bacterial meningitis. Uh, the reason we are not able to confirm the diagnosis is because of one, late presentation, two, use of antibiotics prior to presentation to a health facility. In any case, most of the children in meningitis will present with fever and other things, difficulties in feeding, uh, irritability. And my good uh, teacher, Professor Bubu, used to tell me, coma and conversions um, are complications of meningitis. 
So I think the most important thing is the correct diagnosis, which is easier said than done. Uh, thank you, Dr. Makewa. Um, we'll go to the next question. I hope your question has been answered. Um, uh, the next question is list uh, the major types, or someone is asking what would be the major type of food that you would give to these children who have meningitis? I think uh, Dr. Kigathi will take this question. I think it's, um, so just to reiterate, um, acute bacterial meningitis is an emergency. These children should be treated as being um, acutely ill children. And many of them, once you're in coma or once you're having repeated convulsions, it's an important thing to mention that these are children who are critically ill. So after you've considered going through an ABCD approach, your nutrition should be that of the critically ill patient. And perhaps these are children who you may want to feed through an NG tube to maintain the enteral feeding ongoing and to maintain their caloric requirements because often when they are just on um, NG tube feeds, they, I mean, when they're on IV fluids alone, they often get um, the, the sort of malnutrition of critical illness. So it's important to put in an NG tube. Many times we continue with um, fluid diets that are able to fulfill their caloric requirements. And thereafter, as you recover, then you're able to reinstate the, the other diet as, as required. But these should be children who are treated as critically ill children. Thank you, Dr. Kigathi. Our next question is, um, what would be your empiric treatment uh, for meningitis in resource-limited settings? I think Dr. Molo can take this one. Um, I think uh, we've, we've mentioned uh, that uh, ceftriaxone is a good drug of choice um, for the patient. So usually cephalosporins are readily available in our setting at least. So that's something that we can start our patients on. Just important to remember that you have to give high dose um, ceftriaxone in order to, to fight the infection. Of course, if you're suspecting an encephalitis, it's good to add a cyclovir, but commonly the viral encephalitis, we don't really have a specific treatment for them, but we usually give a cyclovir just to help fight any viral encephalitis that the patient may be having. Again, our uh, so that's what you start empirically, then any other treatment will be guided by your supportive laboratory findings. Thank you for that. Um, is there anyone who has anything else to add in regards to treatment? I'd also want to mention that many times we have children who are coming in with shunt infections. Um, so it's probably a good idea to broaden our cover, um, especially in children with recent shunts or shunts that may need um, um, revision. Many times you see these children who come in with either meningitis or ventriculitis, that's when we consider agents such as vancomycin, something to cover for staphylococcal infections. But that, as you have said, is guided by the cultures that we'll do of the CSF. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is, are there any specific uh, CT scan findings for tuberculous meningitis or for any other etiology, how would you be able to determine that a patient has meningitis from a CT scan? Anyone can take the question. Well, at, um, I'll just take a portion of that. Well, a CT scan is uh, more of a supportive diagnosis. You wouldn't say that there are classical findings on a CT scan that would tell you, yes, this patient has meningitis, but common things that you may see are cerebral edema, you may have hydrocephalus. So these ones you'd not be able to see the clear sulci and gyral pattern that you'd expect on a normal CT scan. Uh, in cases of a brain abscess or tuberculoma, you might may, you may find an abnormal echo density on the CT scan, which would guide you 
um, to that. If the patient has suffered a hypoxic injury secondary to meningitis, then you may again see abnormal echogenicity on the CT scan uh, of the patient. If you, if you find that something that's very unusual on the CT scan, it's always good to do a follow-up MRI of the brain because MRI is better able to tell us um, structural abnormalities and give us more finer detail than what you would see on a CT scan. Just to add on to that, I think CT scan with contrast will give us mainly in TB meningitis, basal meningitis, where there's enhancing of the basal meninges, and that is sort of characteristic of TB, not necessarily um, confirmatory. Um, if I could mention also, um, since the diagnosis of the TB meningitis can be quite a challenge. Um, if you look online, there are a few pediatric TB meningitis scores, like there's one called the Lancet Consensus Score that um, captures all your clinical findings, um, findings around the determination of whether there's any um, microbiological diagnosis, any um, radiological findings, and all those put together are then combined into sort of a probable or a possible meningitis. So it might be worthwhile to consider that. And they have different scores for um, when you have radiological findings and when you don't have radiological findings, so that you don't miss any of the children who are presenting with pediatric TB meningitis. We can forward that to the if they would like to see it. Yes, uh, thank you for that. We'll also forward to all the participants at the end of the presentation. Um, just, um, just in addition to the question on CT scan, uh, one of the attendants would like to know when is a CT scan indicated and also between a CT scan and an MRI, which one would be of value? I think anyone can take the question. Um, most of the times when you do a CT scan is uh, when you have uh, suggestive findings from your clinical examination. For instance, if you do your clinical exam and you see there are unequal pupils, the bulging anterior fontanelle, or if you have the head circumference unusually uh, increased, or sometimes if you have a child who has an abnormally shaped skull and you're thinking may have a syndrome and therefore predisposed to meningitis. So you, you really need to look at your clinical findings to point as to whether or not you need to do a CT scan because we don't do CT scans on everybody. Usually you look at your clinical findings and that will help you decide. Thank you, Dr. Lucia. Our next question is, uh, what are the treatment outcomes for patients with bacterial meningitis and TB meningitis, both uh, short-term and long-term? Uh, any of the panelists can take the question. Well, TB meningitis is associated with high morbidity and mortality, as we had mentioned, and a lot of the patients would usually be left with the um, post-meningitic sequelae. Like if we come to the clinic, you'll see a lot of them now have um, convulsive disorders. A lot of them have had hydrocephalus. Now they have a VP shunt in C2. Some of them, if uh, the meningitis was severe and it involved other parts of the brain, they may have cerebral palsy, they may have movement disorders if it involves the basal ganglia. So a lot of them would usually have some sort of post-meningitic sequelae. As for the exact figures, uh, maybe Dr. Makewa can give us. Um, no, I don't have the exact figures, but what I know about uh, acute bacterial meningitis, meningitis, as Dr. Kigabi said, this is, these are children who are very severely sick. Uh, and largely depends on when, when the diagnosis of acute bacterial meningitis is made. If it's made before, as I said, before the complications happen, uh, 
then there are higher chances of recovery. But if it's made late when complications have happened, of course we end up with uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, thank you for that. We'll go on to the next question. Um, this question is um, on anticonvulsants uh, given to a patient who's convulsing and they're asking between benzodiazepines and barbiturates, uh, what is recommended and what caution should we take when administering these drugs? Well, I can take that. For, so, um, as I had mentioned, we have the national guidelines that guide on how we are supposed to treat a child who comes in convulsing. It, it's good to know the type of convulsion that the child is having. I think if you read the International League Against Epilepsy, you will just see how generally we classify convulsions, generalized tonic-clonic, catonic, myoclonic, clonic, tonic. So again, in the long-term treatment, the type of uh, convulsion that the child is having will guide the anti-epileptic drugs that you give. However, in the acute period when the child is coming in status epileptic as uh, lenting convulsions, we usually follow our protocol. So usually we'd start with uh, benzodiazepine. So locally we have diazepam available. I think we also have midazolam and lorazepam is coming up. So you can give two doses of this. If the, con if the convulsions persist, then you can give either phenobarbitone or phenytoin, which again are both readily available in our setting. So you can opt for either of them, a loading dose. Then once you do that, then you can start a maintenance dose of either of them. So Thank just yeah, follow the, the, the usually guidelines on how you <laughs> drugs that you use. But as I mentioned, there are many new drugs that are coming up. Some even better, some trials are still ongoing. So we'll keep seeing changes, but we can stick to the guidelines for now. Just a note on the convulsions. Um, many times we might find that we are rushing to um, employ the use of anticonvulsants. And it's important to remember that there are many other concurrent causes that might be present. Um, during a child or, or during the presentation of a child with meningitis. So if you go through your ABCDs, even before you give an anticonvulsant, you'll be able to, um, you'll be able to address many of the causes of um, possible convulsions, even before we get to the point of um, giving the anticonvulsants. So in terms of your air and breathing, you want to make sure that you have the child on a saturation monitor and that you're tracking the saturations well, making sure there's no hypoxia. Under circulation, you want to make sure that the child is not hypovolemic, um, is not in shock. Um, under D, you want to check the child's blood sugar. And then um, as part of your investigations, you want to rule out um, many of the electrolyte abnormalities that we might have as a result of the um, meningitis. Many times you get hyponatremia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, all these are things that we would look at correcting as you're addressing the convulsions. And then as if the convulsions persist, especially past your loading doses, you've given two doses of the benzodiazepine, lorazepam or diazepam. And then thereafter you found that you've given the first loading dose of phenobarb, you might even give the first dose of phenytoin, then it's good for us to reach out to ICU. Because many times, if you're getting into that um, category of status epilepticus, they might need to do further things that might need an ICU setting for both monitoring and further intervention. So we don't want to delay too much. By the time we are getting to the first and second loading doses, we try as much as possible to reach out to the, the critical care team. Thank you for that. Our next question is, in, uh, in regards to the management, what would be your duration of treatment of uh, encephalitis with acyclovir? I think uh, any of the panelists can take the, the question. 
I, I think the recommended duration of treatment for treatment of encephalitis with a cycle of it is 10 to 14 days, 20, 21 days. Variable. Because sometimes, of course, you don't know which virus is causing it. If it is the happiest group, then you are sure it's going to, to, to be sensitive to a cycle of it. If you are not, then you're throwing your bubs. Uh, thank you, Dr. Makewa. Um, the next question is on role of steroids in TB meningitis. Uh, do we give and how much do we give? Uh, anyone can take the question. So with regards to steroids, um, so there's, there's varied literature on what, what you can do. Um, for bacterial meningitis, they suggest that you need, if you're going to use steroids, it needs to be given with the first dose of the antibiotic. They say that even if you delay by about an hour, um, it, it precludes the, the use, the efficacy almost goes to nil. Um, for TB meningitis, some, some literature also mentions that steroids might be useful. And it talks about um, either dexamethasone or prednisone um, that are carried out for a long period of time, three to four, weeks and then they taper off the dose. But the, again, it depends on the patient that you have in front of you. You want to make sure that you either have confirmed the diagnosis or your benefits outweigh the risk because these are critically ill children. And in the balance of things, you want to make sure that you're giving um, um, therapy that is beneficial for the patient, it has more benefits than risks to the patient. Um, uh, thank you for that, Bill. Is there anyone else who had something to add in regards to steroid use? Okay, uh, we'll go to the next question. Um, what, how would you differentiate between a febrile conversion or one that is secondary to meningitis? Um, so um, I can it's me. I'll start It's okay. You can go ahead, Dr. Makewa. If if a patient is having a febrile conversions, um, so we are talking of febrile conversions. If you're talking about febrile conversions, let us remember that febrile conversions is a diagnosis of exclusion. So number one, you have to exclude meningitis. So it's going to be a conversion because it's fever and the focus of infection is not the CNS. It could be any other any other organ. So for meningitis, then we are talking about CNS infections. So you have to be sure then we are dealing with a patient who is having conversions, has got fever, and has got features of meningitis, and you confirm the meningitis. Um, thank you for that. Um, our next question is on isoniazid prophylaxis. Um, how long would you give it for in a child who is HIV positive? I think Dr. Amolo, you can take that question. Um, so in a child who is HIV positive, um, you should, it depends. Uh, I think if a child is HIV infected and is above one year, then you'd give, um, you'll give it regardless. However, if a child is HIV infected and, and, and under one year, but has been exposed to the case, then that is when you give. So if it's under one year and has not been exposed, you don't give. If they're over one year and uh, they have been 
whether or not they've been exposed then you give the isoniazid uh, preventative therapy. Usually the duration I believe is uh, four weeks, but I have to confirm that. I'd have to confirm the exact duration, but I believe it's four weeks. Uh, thank you. Our next question is on fungal meningitis. What would be the preferred treatment of choice now that amphotericin B is not uh, in circulation? This is to any of the panelists. I, I think there are other options that you would look at, like uh, flu, uh, flu cytosine. Um, the next question is, how would you identify a patient with immune-mediated meningitis? Um, I think it's, it's important for us to, so you'd find that there are features of, um, um, probably when you do our CSF analysis, we get that there are um, lymphocytes in the CSF, Sometimes you might get um, varied levels of protein because there is um, the immune-mediated antibody release within the CSF. But um, in these cases, it's important to really think about ensuring that we culture the CSF. Um, our CSF is very, it's a very fragile specimen. So we try our best to um, process it within the hour. For it to be cultured correctly, then you need to ensure that CSF is taken to the lab and is cultured within the hour of the, the CSF being taken. Um, additionally, some centers in Nairobi also have um, CSF um, PCRs that can be done that rule out both the common bacterial and viral infections. So in the absence of positive cultures as well as um, having ruled out PCRs that are negative, then you might think of a septic meningitis of which one of the differentials would be immune mediated meningitis. But it needs us to be very specific on how we really take care of that CSF. Immediately it's taken, we process it correctly and have the results taken both for culture and for PCR. Uh, thank you for that, Bill. Uh, so we've come to the end of our question and answer session. I'd like to thank uh, our presenter for the very interesting case and for the excellent presentation on approach to a child's, um, to, to management of a child with meningitis. And I think she managed to cover meningitis, convulsions, tuberculous meningitis, hydrocephalus, uh, acute liver failure and isoniazid prophylaxis in one presentation. And, and I think we've learned quite a lot from this presentation. I'd also like to thank our panelists, Dr. Bill Pigathi and Dr. Douglas Makewa for the contribution towards the question and answer session. Uh, I think we can all agree that it was a very interesting discussion and we've learned quite a lot uh, in regards to this topic. I'd like to hand over to Dr. Nancy Gumbao uh, to, to close our session. Um, thank you very much um, for that very interesting session. Um, and I believe we've learned a lot um, concerning the approach of a child with meningitis. Um, just a few highlights. So in the evening, we will be having another session on the paroscopic ectopic pregnancies and from 7 to 8.30 p.m. If you're interested, can you join using the same link? Uh, and you'll be able to listen and learn about ectopic pregnancy. Um, tomorrow is World Psoriasis Day, and um, we will be having a presentation on psoriasis. Um, 
and this will be done by Dr. Jose Overu, Dr. Saini, Dr. Ivanson Kamuri, and Dr. Favete. And um, kindly note that to join this webinar, there'll be a different link. And this link will have been sent to you on your email, or it's also the one that's displaying right now. So use that link to be able to join that webinar. Otherwise, have a very good evening, and thank you for um, being part of us during this webinar session. Have a lovely day.